comes from Psalm 95. Read with me, please. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord our God you reign forever our hope our strong deliverer you are the God, you do not faint, you won't grow weary, you're the defender of the weak, you comfort those in need, you lift us up on wings, mighty.
trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same ushers will come forward. We're going to prepare to worship the Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Lord, we're reminded this morning of the place where it says that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We are so grateful for everything you've given us. We want to give something of that back to you to worship you and praise you and recognize that all of the things that we have are yours for you to use as you will. In Jesus' name, amen.
Dear Lord, we are so grateful that you are here with us this morning. We are grateful that you are our comforter. We're also grateful that you are our teacher. We pray this morning that you will soften and open our hearts, that your word will speak as it always does, and that we will hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. The kids can come on up on the stage for the children's message with Pastor Brock. And after the children's message, you can go back to sit with your families or you can go to children's church. trying to steal stuff from us, breaking into our house, and trying to take our food. And I told him, I said, I'm going to hit you. And I did. I head-butted him with my head. That's the hardest part of my body. I don't know what to do. That bear is an enemy to us. And he lives real close to us. He's a neighbor, too. And he's always coming around, and he's always asking for food, and then if we don't give it to him, he waits till the middle of the night and he tries to break into our house. <laughs> Rat says he has to stay up all night watching for him. Is that a problem? <laughs> no, he stays up all night anyway. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Well, what do you think Jesus would do? Well, I don't think it says anywhere in the Bible about what Jesus would do with a bear. Yes? What do you think Jesus would do? Um, well, something that I caught on is you said neighbor. And uh, one thing that it says in the Bible is to love your neighbor. So I got the idea of also when you said what would Jesus would do, Jesus would pray for him. Yeah, he would probably, wouldn't he? Yes. What do you, what do you think Jesus would do? Huh? What, what, what did you say? I didn't hear you. Sorry. And wait until the morning. Wait until the morning? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes you have to think a little bit to know what Jesus would do, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh-huh. He is a neighbor. He's also an enemy. But you know, I think, uh, I think you understand. I think we should put there in jail. Put the bear in jail? Because he keeps on stowing. Yeah. Like yeah. Guys. Yeah, it's, it's really hard sometimes to know where you have an enemy. Did you have something, Journey, you want to say? What, what should what they do? Give them a berry. <laughs> Give the bear a berry? Okay, yeah, we have several things. Maybe, maybe Jesus would pray for that bear because he's his neighbor or, or love the bear because Jesus said love your enemies, uh, love your neighbors and love your enemies. Yes? Uh -huh. Give him some food so he won't come back. Yeah, maybe you could give him some food too. Although sometimes if you start feeding a bear, he might come back more, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because then he thinks that he's just But maybe, maybe you could go take some food out someplace where the bear was and feed him, or maybe call the ranger and have the bear take the food some, the, have the ranger take the bear someplace where he can get his own food. But, but he didn't come here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, Jesus did say, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, even pray for your enemies. And he said, even said, give food to strangers. So that's some good ideas, kids, about what you might do. Now, if, if it wasn't a bear and it was your friend, what would you do? 
If it were somebody that you knew that was being mean to you. Yeah? Then it would be, be an easy question of pray for them. Yeah, pray for them. Uh-huh. Yes? What did you say? Tell them an adult. Huh? Tell them an adult. Uh-huh. That's right. Yeah. You could talk to an adult about it. But Jesus said, love even your enemies. So we have to love and pray for people even when, when they're mean to us. Did you ever have anybody be mean to you? Yeah. Yeah. Did you pray for them? Did you ever show them love by being nice to them? Have you ever did that? I actually did that recently. You did? Yep. Good. Well, that's what a Christian does. That's what someone that loves Jesus does. We, we love those even that are mean to us. Um, and so you remember that, okay? Hey, kids, thanks for listening. You can go to Kids Church now. Yay! Go to Kids Church. We've been working through the different, uh, our values and, and our strategies as a church. And uh, today, today I'm going to talk about strategy and value number one, we'll train every person to make disciples. Now that's a goal, obviously. Uh, and and uh, you may say, well, that's quite a goal to have everybody trained to make disciples. But really, as, if we work together to make disciples, I think it's a, a goal that we can actually reach. <laughs> And I'm gonna, I want to start by explaining what a disciple is. And I know that that's really pretty basic if you've been around the church a long time. But not everybody here has been around the church a long time. And, uh, and even if it is very basic, if, if you ever um, were in sports or, or uh, even in math or whatever, you always go back to the basics and have to remind yourself the basics one, once in a while. And so for me, it may be basic... But when I was going over it for my sermon this week, I thought, yeah, this is really basic, but I still could grow or improve in every one of these areas of making disciples. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, what that means. What does it mean to make a disciple? Really, what is a disciple? And, uh, you know, I guess I could uh, probably keep us here for a couple hours and just read through the whole Bible, right? <laughs> Uh, there's a lot, in, lot to making a disciple. It can be get kind of overwhelming at times, but I want us to focus on the basics. I believe that the most important thing in all the world is to make disciples of Jesus. And I believe that because as a believer, when we die, or if Jesus were to come back, the only thing that's going to survive is the eternal. And we were really reminded of that this past week. We had two, mem two wonderful members of our congregation die. Uh, Dale Loveland, which some of you may not know because he's uh, been at home and not been able to get out for a long time. But those of you who've been around the church a long time remember, uh, probably remember him. And some of you have even visited him in his home down in Turlock. And then, of course, Vivian, who's been around. And some of you may, uh, may know her, too. And we're reminded when, when someone passes away that really, you know, this life is short. We're not going to be here forever. But we do believe that every person is eternal. They're spiritual. Or what the Bible says, they have a soul. There's, there's a part of our essence that survives this life. And if that is so, then growing in the spiritual part of our life is the most important thing in the world. And the way that we do that is becoming, by becoming more like Jesus, sitting under his uh, feet, so to speak, praying, listening to him, working together as a church, learning to be a disciple, to become like Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing in all the world. And Jesus believed that it was the most important thing too because the last thing that he said before he left this earth is recorded in Matthew chapter 8, 28, verses 18 through 20. And this is what Jesus said. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you all always to the very end of the age. I wasn't planning on preaching on this, but I just noticed it talks about all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to you. Then he gives us this command. So that command comes with his authority, which is all the authority on heaven and earth. And lately in our culture, the American culture, for the first time in our history, Christians 
are being told that you can't make disciples. You can't talk about Jesus. You can't do this and pray about Jesus. You can't preach about Jesus. And now for the first time in even the government is starting to say that or tell us what we should do when it's contrary to what really the scripture says. And I want to remind us that all authority on heaven and on earth is the Lord's. Amen. And regardless of what any politician says, your first allegiance is not to the U.S. or even the Constitution. It's to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if they should change the Constitution or interpret it in such a way that it violates your faith and you have to break the law, we go by a higher law. All authority on heaven and, in, and on earth is Jesus Christ and He's number one. He's the one that we are going to count to. When we stand before God, if God should take another one of us this week, when we stand before God, He's not going to ask us, did you obey all the laws in the U.S.? Even the illegal ones, the uh, legal illegal for the Lord, or did you uh, did you do this or do you did you do that? He's we're going to stand and we're going to be judged based on our relationship with God and whether He is Lord of our life. And there isn't a person in this whole uh, group here that can say that we will be able to say that we've lived the perfect life. It's only by the grace of God and His mercy and forgiveness and standing on the cornerstone, which we sang about a little while ago, Jesus Christ, that we're going to be able to survive and stand on that day. We're going to point to Jesus Christ and say, no, I didn't always do everything that was right. I tried to become a disciple of Christ. I grew in the Lord. I tried to do what you did. But I'm standing on the blood and the right righteousness of Jesus Christ. So all authority was given to him, and our, that authority, he says, we are to use that to make disciples. That's the core of the whole Bible. So Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples, and he knew what that meant in his culture. But we do not have a culture of discipleship in, in, these day, in this day and age. We don't have a culture of discipleship. You know what kind of culture we have? We have a culture of information. We are bombarded continually with information. Information fills our heads, but it doesn't reach our heart. It doesn't reach the values by which we live. It doesn't reach our practice, our hands and, and feet and what we do. You see, discipleship is not just acquiring information in our heads. It's our head, our heart, our hands, and our feet. It's a way of living and being. It proceeds from the depths of our spirit, and what is inside comes out. I think I, we saw that a couple weeks ago. Two weeks ago, a young, angry man walked into Umpqua State College in Roseburg, Oregon, and began uh, shooting people. He shot the teacher first, then in two classrooms he asked people to stand, asked if they were Christian, and then if they said, yes, I am a Christian, he would shoot them in the head. If they would not talk, he sh talk or tell them what their faith was, he shot them in the leg. I saw a video by Franklin Graham this week. Franklin Graham is called Billy Graham's uh, son, and he's the one that leads that Samaritan's Purse uh, uh, ministry and, and the Operation Christmas Child that we were involved in. And Franklin said that this was martyrdom on American soil. And really it was. When President Obama talked about it, he blamed, the easy, it, blamed it on the easy access of guns in our society. When the local news media talked about it, they said it was a random act of violence. Well, I have, to, I have to tell you that a gun did not walk into that college and shoot people. A man did. And it was not random. It was a premeditated mass murder planned out of an evil and angry heart. And I would quote Jesus here in Matthew 15. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of, the, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder. That murder came out of that man's heart. Adultery, sexual immorality, theft. The churches broke in this morning. It was out of their heart that, that, that those people broke into the church because they wanted to get something. Probably for drugs, I would imagine, or something. False testimony, in other words, lying and slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. It isn't, it isn't what we take into ourselves, uh, as far as what we eat or drink, that's going to pollute our spirit. Now, it might pollute our body, 
but it doesn't pollute our spirit. It's when we take stuff in, and it isn't even the environment that we live in that necessarily causes defilement. It's what do we do with it once it comes our way. Jesus said the light of the, the, light of the uh, eye, the lamp of the body is the eye. When we take things in, what do we do with it? Do we turn away from evil? Or do we take and dwell on it? Dwell in our anger. And out of that anger that that young man dwelled on, out came murder. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 20 and 22, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. I don't know what Raka means. I don't, think, I don't know if anybody does, but it was apparently a really bad word back then. The murderer knew just enough about Christians to hate them. He probably had some head knowledge about Christians, or maybe he had met a Christian who really wasn't an example of Jesus Christ, but said they were a Christian. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 15, 18, that we shouldn't be surprised by this. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. The leader of our movement, Jesus Christ, was crucified on a cross. That young man who murdered Christians never knew the love of Christ. He may never have been in introduced to the real and living Jesus. Or perhaps he was and he rejected Jesus. And I couldn't help but wonder what could have been different if a Christian had come into that person's life and shown him the love of Christ. If his heart had been transformed by Jesus, he certainly wouldn't have gone out and committed murder. What if someone who had introduced this angry young ma uh, man to the Jesus that loved him enough to die on the cross for him? You see, discipleship is not just not making clones of us. We're imperfect. Discipleship is helping each other become more like Jesus. Jesus is the one who disciples. We point people towards him. Jesus is the one who transforms hearts. Only Jesus can do it. And if a person is going to need to be tra is going to be transformed by Jesus, they must first get to know the real Jesus. He's alive. He rose from the dead. You can get to know him. And you need to spend time with him. And when you spend time with somebody, you become like them. That's why my mom was always concerned about the people that I hung around with. And as a kid, the kids that I hung around with, their moms were concerned about them hanging around me. <laughs> you become like the people that you hang around with. So if you hang around Jesus, you hang around a person who loves God, you become like them. Well, we spend time with Jesus by reading his word, by getting to know him through the witness of the disciples, and by doing what he tells us to do. We not only can listen and get to know him, but we also need to do the things that he's doing. There's personal quiet time with him that brings us close to him, but we also bring him with us throughout the day and talk to him throughout the day and say, Lord, what would you do? Like the question I asked the kids, what would Jesus do? in that situation where you've got a bear breaking into your cabin. I have no idea what Jesus would do about a bear breaking into a cabin, but I thought the kids had some good ideas there. But however important time with God is, it is incomplete if you look at the record of Scripture. Jesus called disciples, not a disciple. Did you ever realize that? He called disciples, not a disciple. They formed a group. It was really a family of believers. One time when Jesus' family was knocking on the door and they thought he was going nuts because he was, uh, the crowds were following him and he hadn't had rest or even hadn't even had time to eat, they said, your family is out here. And Jesus looks around the people that are uh, sitting there listening to him and he says, this, these are my family. Those who do the will of my Father in heaven, those are my family. He formed a family of believers. 
And so the process of becoming a disciple occurs within a family of disciples. You see, we are the body of Christ, and we don't really get a full picture of who Jesus is unless we're in a body of Christ. Then we get a fuller picture of Jesus. We see the strengths of each one of us. We see how complete Jesus was. So it's in the family of believers that we help each other to become disciples of Christ. So a disciple has three dimensions to their life, three growing relationships. Up, that relationship with God. In, which is the relationship we have with ourselves and God and, and one another. And then out, a, and that's a relationship with those that are outside of the faith, unbelievers. And Jesus modeled that in his life. If you read the accounts of Jesus' life, the eyewitness accounts, which you'll find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see that he was always going from one to the other. There was a time when he would get alone with God and spend an up time. There was in time after he'd ministered with the crowds where they would get together as disciples and they would spend time talking and discussing what was going on and he would send them out and train them. And there was out time where the time that he spent with the people that wanted to be healed or wanted to listen to his words ministering to them. Up, in, and out. That's the life of a disciple. Those are three relationships that every disciple has if they are to be a complete disciple. Up, relationship with God. In, relationship with other believers. And out, reaching out to those that are different than us or don't have the same beliefs. Now let me explain each one of those. Our relationship is first of all up. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If a disciple is to love God, they must first hear the good news that God created them and loves them. Love in a disciple is a response to the love of the Master. Jesus loved us so much, we teach this good news that He died for us. And he died so that he would rest restore our relationship with God. That's nicknamed the gospel or the good news. That's the great news. The Apostle Paul talks about it in Romans 10, and he very clearly explains it. He says in verses uh, 8 through 12, The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that is proclaimed. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You've got to believe who He is and declare it. He is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You have to first believe the good news of who Jesus is. He came here to be our Savior. That we have to be saved. We have to turn our lives over to Him. And that's really pretty easy. It can be a simple prayer like this. Lord, I believe you died on the cross to save me. I confess that I'm a sinner and need your mercy, forgiveness, and grace. Come into my life. I make you Lord of my life. It can be as simple as that, believing the good news and just responding and accepting what Jesus did for you on the cross and then saying, Lord, I give you my life. You died for me. I willingly respond to your love by loving you back. When we find out how much God loves us, our response is to love Him back. And that begins a relationship, but it doesn't stop. Jesus summed up this relationship with God this way in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. I read the first part of that. It's called the Great Commandment by Christians. And this was it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that's talking about the fact that there is no other God before God. He's the only God. Nothing else is so important in all the world as this Creator, knowing who he, who he is and knowing Him. And then He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then Jesus adds a second command, which wasn't in the original command that He quoted in, uh, from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is where he quoted the Old Testament. He's quoting the Old Testament here. He's summing up the whole Bible. 
And he adds this. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And if you divide the Ten Commandments up, the first commandments talk about love of God, and the second group of commandments talk about loving your neighbor. And it gives you specific ways that you can love your neighbor by not lying, by not coveting. You know, those kinds of things. The first commandments have to do with putting God number one in our life. So he's summing up the whole Bible and all the commandments in these two great commandments. And when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he's really talking about your heart is the place where you make decisions. Okay, your will. We would call it your will. You decide to follow Christ. Your mind, of course, is, is in knowing and getting to know God and learning more about Him. Okay? Your soul is your spirit, that connection that encompasses your mind and, and your body and your heart, your whole self. That's your soul. Okay? And your strength is behavior, your obedience, doing the Word of God. It's your body and, and following through on everything. So what he's saying is that this faith that we have in God, this relationship, is not just an intellectual relationship. It's not just of the heart. You know, uh, there might be people that their relationship with God is, is primarily from the heart, but they don't, they don't spend any time learning who God is and it doesn't affect their mind. I can think this or I can think that. I just made this decision sometime in the past and I gave my heart to God and now I'm a Christian. That's not being a disciple either. It's everything. And it has to be your strength. You can't just in your mind and in your heart say, I believe God, I do this, I, 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 I love God, and then go on and live however you want. It affects every uh, part of your being, your mind, your heart, your soul, and even your strength, what, what, how you use your strength and your gifts and your abilities and what you do in life. So that's the relationship, the up, and that's the primary relationship that affects every other relationship in us as a disciple. Secondly, a, a disciple is a, a person who has a deepening and growing relationship in uh, did you ever notice that loving ourselves is also part of the great commandment? It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Included in loving ourselves is really our families, our spouse and children, our extended family, and even our church family. That's the end part of being a disciple. We are growing in love for ourselves. Uh, in our day and age, they talk about self-actualization or self-esteem. Self-esteem for a Christian is based on the fact that God loves you so incredible much that He would die on the cross for you. That's what our self-esteem is built on. And our self-esteem is built on being in a loving family, a family of believers. And it goes even beyond our nuclear fa family, our, our, mo our moms and dads and our extended family. It goes into anybody that's a brother and a sister in Jesus Christ that knows Jesus is part of our family. Jesus is quoted by John, and he says, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The depth and quality of our relationship with one another should stand out. The love that's within our families, in our church families, should be outstanding. Jesus said it this way, he talked about us being outstanding. He said, we are like salt. Keep your saltiness, he said. And salt preserves and flavors everything you put it into. We're like salt among each other. We preserve and flavor each other. Okay? We are like salt in the world. Uh, wherever we are, we bring that presence of the Lord Jesus with us, and it should have an influence on the place that we are at. Jesus said we are lamps. Lamps are not hid. They're put up on a stand. Don't hide the Lord Jesus. Let him shine forth in your life. When you have an opportunity to say something for him and he leads you to say something, do it. Speak out for him. Don't hide. Don't put it under a, a lamp. Put your lamp under a bushel or a basket. And as Jesus within us is our salt, he's our light, allow him to fully flavor every area of your life and add flavor to wherever you go.
Allow his light to fill you and burst forth from you. Allow him to love your brothers and sisters in Christ and everyone else you come in contact with. Got family problems? Love one another. Allow Jesus to do it in you if you can't do it in yourself. We serve one another. We care for one another. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. We even admonish one another. That's kind of an old word. Admonish means, means uh, talking to someone and saying, hey, you need to step it up. You're not living the way you should in this area of your life. We even do that. That's part of being the family, having that accountability with one another. You know, someone says, well, I haven't been to church for four or five weeks. I've just had too much to do. And you say, sure glad Jesus didn't have that attitude before he went to the cross for you. You know, I don't have time to read my Bible, you know. Uh, no, I can't get along with that person. They're, they're bad. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. We admonish one another. We spur one another on. It says this in Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. What happens when you take iron and sharpen iron? You get sparks, don't you? Every once in a while, our relationships need a little spark. And I don't mean a spark of love. I'm talking about we got to go against each other and say, hey, fuck it up, you know? Hold each other accountable for growing in the Lord. In Hebrews it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That's not who you are. This is who you are in Christ. Don't let it get you down. Go for it. Take the risk. Spur one another on. The third dimension of our relationship, that's the second dimension, the in relationship within the family. And a good, healthy family is not all just putting things and sweeping everything under the rug. They deal with stuff. That's a healthy family, but they love one another. That's the, the, the other dimension. The, the third dim dimension is the out dimension, and Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That was quoted by one of the children this morning. Jesus was asked by a Bible lawyer to sum up the whole Bible, all the commandments, and he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the Bible lawyer figured he loved God enough, probably didn't, <laughs> but he figured he did, but there were maybe some people that he really did not love, so he tried to get out of it like lawyers do by parsing words, and so he says, well... Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, the Bible calls him a scribe. That's a Bible lawyer, okay? Who is my neighbor? You see, if I can limit the people I'm supposed to love to the people I already love, that's pretty easy, isn't it? And Jesus responded with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And you've read it. It's in Luke about the guy that was beat up by robbers and uh, the... Uh, uh, Levite, who's a religious caste, came by and walked on the other side. Then a priest came by and walked on the other side. And finally, this Samaritan, who is supposedly this person that we don't associate with, comes by and he takes him and takes care of him, binds up his wounds and takes him to an inn and gives the innkeeper money and says, take care of him. And then Jesus turns the question around. He says, well, rather than ask limiting who my neighbor is and saying who's my neighbor is people that I already love. Who was, who was the neighbor to the person? And he says, I suppose it was the Samaritan. He hated to admit that. And Jesus says, well, go and do that. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Who's the neighbor? The neighbor is someone who, whom you co who comes along. Uh, the neighbor is, is the person that's in your life path that has a need. And uh, do you show with deeds and actions and words of encouragement or do you walk by on the other side? That's what Jesus is saying. The out of being a disciple is a really, really difficult and it gets really messy sometimes. It was really difficult for Jesus on the cross and it was messy, wasn't it? It was pretty messy and pretty difficult for that guy who, who found that naked bloody guy on the road and he picked him up and bandaged his, room, his, his wounds and carried him to the inn, put him on his donkey. 
When you reach out in love to someone in an act of kindness, God blesses it with his power and his presence is in it. Jesus shines through you. Your service and your offerings are used by God. You know, even when you give in the offering here, you're doing God's will. It enables our church family to reach outside these walls and help people. Not only in our community, but around the world. Uh, this morning when we were getting ready to, uh, to have worship, um, I was sitting in this front row and right behind me was my grandson, Reese, and his dad, uh, Jason, right here. And uh, during the offering, um, Reese says, Daddy, do we give offering? Because he never sees uh, Jason give offering. Well, their family uh, gives electronically, uh, monthly, in the church, just like we give out of our salary and stuff, so we don't actually physically put our money in the offering. And that's an option for those of you who, who like that. And Jason explained to him, he said, no, we give electronically every month. It comes directly out of, as a, as a check that we send to the church or money we electronically send to the church every month. And he says, well, where does that money go? Does, it, does that go, money all go to Grandpa? <laughs> I wish. No, no, I really don't. I really don't wish that. I, I, I get plenty of money to live, live on. I thank the Lord for the church here for that. It goes to some of the, our pastoral and staff salaries and so forth. And Jason was explaining to him, he says, well, you know, so that, that money goes to help the poor here and, and in other areas. He says some of the money goes to help so that we have a building to worship God in and do our classes in. And he says, yeah, and some of that money goes to Grandpa, you know. And you know, you know what your money, your money represents your work because you have to work really, really hard for it. So it does, in a sense, represent your service and your work. And I know sometimes we may get to the place where we can't do much physical work. Yesterday I worked for for three or four hours uh, um, blowing the gutters and I had to get down kind of not on my knees but I had to lean down and do it and I used to be able to do that something like that for eight or ten hours and then I could you know go home and enjoy it and just wake up the next day and it just totally physically wiped me out I'm 59 years old and I'm not physically able to do stuff like I used to do and there are some of you who are maybe at the place where you couldn't do any of that and what you can do is you can pray. Uh, you can still use your mouth. You can call someone up and encourage. You can still use your hands, although maybe your hands shake a little bit. You can write a note. You can pray. You can talk. You can encourage someone, but physically you can't serve like you used to. Or maybe you can't even, there's some stuff that you can't even do as far as service in the church that doesn't even require a lot of physical. You just don't have the energy to do it anymore. But you can serve, and you can give, and you can pray. And God never requires us to do more than what we can do. You know, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. God never requires you to do more than what you can do. His burden is not, is not a heavy yoke. It's a joy. It's a joy to serve the Lord. And we saw 15 or more people yesterday just doing work around the church here, just serving the Lord. And every week we have people helping with kids. But this isn't the, the limit of what we do is out on your job, when you use your mouth to encourage someone or you go the extra mile to help somebody, or in your neighborhoods, or, or among your family, and you're helping people, or when you're giving money to the church so that we can help uh, fund a missionary who's bringing the good news across the seas, or help us to disciple people here in our local community, or offer programs for kids. When you do that stuff, you are helping to make a disciple. And uh, God bless you for it. We work together on that. In Romans 5.8, the Apostle Paul stated it this way, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, you can't have that kind of love in yourself 
the, there's a self-preservation that we have, and, it, and, and it, it goes all the way down to trying to hoard or keep everything that we have so that we're safe. There's that self-preservation. It's built into us. It's a safety device so we don't kill ourselves. Maybe some people don't have it, like the people who fly off buildings and stuff. But we have that built into us. So it is unnatural, it is unnatural to do what Jesus did, to give yourself for another person. Now, it, there's a naturalness about doing it for your family. There's like a motherly and fatherly instinct. But when it comes to people outside of that, it's kind of unnatural for us to do that. It doesn't automatically happen. The only way it happens is if there's the love of Christ transforms our heart and we become like Jesus. Jesus does it in us. It comes over as a response to God's love after you've invited God into your life. He enables you to love in ways that you never could love. And not only that, but your whole life, He challenges you to a greater and deeper level of love. You want to know the deep stuff of God? That's the deep stuff of God. You know, anybody can read the Bible and memorize the Scripture. Uh, the had the whole Old Testament, all the works, uh, or at least the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they had those memorized, and yet they didn't show love to their brothers. They thought they were, were superior to the people that were outside of their caste. You can have head knowledge, but only Jesus transforms the heart. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteousness. Unrighteous. And that's the thing that amazes me about God. I don't understand how he can love a sinner or how he can love someone that rejects him or uses his name in vain or hates and, and hurts other people, especially children. I don't see how God can forgive them and love them. But you know, Jesus died on the cross for the whole world. He didn't just die for the select few. For God so loved the whole world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting love. So that kind of level of love can only come from God, opening our life to God, allowing Him into us, and the out dimension comes out of our relationship with God and with other believers. And every one of us is called to love as Jesus loved. That's our goal. It's a huge goal. The goal of a disciple. And then in Romans 10, Paul says this. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Isn't it odd that he talks about beautiful feet here? And I've explained this before. Back then you would wear sandals or maybe you would have um, bare feet. Sometimes the runners the, that would run and, and send good news. We didn't have electronic transfer uh, of information back then. So news was always brought by a runner and the runner would sometimes run miles and they would run on hard stones and their feet would be just full of dirt or maybe cut and bruised. And so they would understand that in their culture that even though those feet are cut and dirty and bruised, it's a dirty work that they did. They, when they come and we see that and that runner brings good news, their feet are beautiful. No matter what they look like, no matter what they had to do to get the news there, they're beautiful. And the reason they talk about the feet is because we have to bring feet to our good news Feet that go to where the people are that need Jesus. We can't expect them to come to us. A mouth that gives witness to what Jesus has done in our life. Jesus said, go and make disciples. It means filling your mind with the thoughts of Jesus. Filling your heart with, with a heart that is willing to do what Jesus wants to do. Making your hands be the hands that reach out 
and serve as Jesus served and making your feet be the place that goes to the people that need Jesus. That's what it is to be a disciple. Up, in, and out. That's what it is to be a disciple. And that is a huge, huge undertaking. And together, that's what we're working on. May God enable you to do that. Now next week I'm going to talk about this again, but I'm going to talk about how you can be involved in making disciples, and I'm going to challenge you to a deeper level of being able to be involved in making disciples. So we'll, we'll work on this one one more week. I'm going to preach on this one, and I'm going to talk about that next week. So the worship team can come up, and uh, we'll finish this uh, service by worshiping the Lord. And as is our custom here, if you want to kneel at this altar while we sing this last song and have a point of contact with God and pray, you're welcome to do so. Let's all stand.
Lord, we do want to hear you in the quiet spaces in our lives. And sometimes we don't leave enough quiet to listen well. Lord, we come to you with all kinds of things on our hearts this morning. And we know that many of us are grieving. For Dale and for Vivian and for others that I don't know about, we thank you, Lord, for being our comforter. And though it seems like we grieve for them, I know it's, we know in our minds, it's more true that we're grieving for ourselves because they died in good relationship with you and are with you in heaven. But be our comforter as we get used to them not being here with us. I know many that are worried this morning, worried about their families, worried about their relationships, not sure how to move forward, not sure how to choose a selfless love or if they can rely on the other person to do the same. Lord, we pray for miracles in our relationships. In, in relationships between husband and wife. In relationships between parent and child. We ask for miracles of healing and forgiveness. All the other worries, Lord, that we bear here and take into your presence trusting, hoping, and with faith that you will help us, that you'll deal with these things for us. We lay them at your feet. Lord, we also bring to you our gratitude, our thanks for the ways that you've provided, for the ways that you have healed, even this week, for the ways that you've blessed us with joy, and even with comfort sometimes that we don't need. Thank you, Lord. You are so good to us. You are such a good, loving Father. Help us more every day and every week to live out our relationship with you, our faith in you, and to be willing to be your good emissaries into the world, to represent you to all the people around us, both accidentally through our normal everyday choices and intentionally in the way that we talk about you before others and introduce them to you. Every part of our lives, we want you to be a part of God. Hard and easy, good and bad. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with this benediction. Go to love and serve the Lord by loving and serving one another. Amen.